This is a topic that has perplexed me since the day I got to Congress. It's not the topic that, complex, that perplexes me as much as the, the, the debate. It's ne it never changes. <laughs> a lot has changed since 2005 and 2007 when the RFS was created during a time of scarcity of natural resources. Of course, we now have an abundance of natural resources. In the meantime, we have some other policy decisions. I mean, we have an administration right now pushing for up to $12,500 per electric vehicle subsidy uh, to, to change the, the demand for electric vehicles. I'm going to just state some facts, and then I'm going to ask just for some feedback. So we, we have this debate over this constantly moving target, right? And we several of us have had this discussion. But And, and what I would say, uh, it would be uh, as a result of lazy legislating, which I'm convinced is, is a, a historical uh, phenomenon in this country, um, administrations have been given an awful lot of leeway to determine things like RVOs, even when they're stated in the law. The, 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 obviously, the, the hardship the small refinery hardship waivers, an, another tool. And then we get, we get upset because, you know, for four years it's one way, and then for four years it's another way, and then for four years it's another way. And I know a couple of you and I have had this discussion, but I, I, when it seems to me that at the end of this year, we, we kind of like to, well, for the last decade, several people I've d discussed this with have liked to deny that at the end of 2022, there's a new rule in place that, that the RVOs are no longer in law. I mean, they're, they're in law, but they're not, they're not required that the authority to set the RVOs. In, in, in other words, the EPA and the administration has even more, more unilateral authority after this year. And I guess I would, I'd, I'd like to just have a little discussion from the panel. What's your understanding? We'll start with you, Ms. Johnson. What's your understanding of, of the act when, it, when, when the RVOs switch over, or the EPA gets carte blanche, in my view, authority uh, in 2023 to set the RVOs? I mean, what, what are, where, where are we going to go if nothing happens and they have that authority? Thank you, Senator. I think that's an excellent question and something that keeps me awake at night because I see this freight train heading towards the highest possible RVOs to try to break through the blend wall and to promote E15. The problem is that um, EPA had discretion in how to set up the program, and it set up the program in such a way that it distorted competition. Um, growth energy has stood shoulder to shoulder with the American Petroleum Institute, which represents the large integrated refineries, preventing closing the blender loophole. So essentially, Gross' theory is that just keep pushing, just keep pushing, just keep pushing. At some point, E15 will happen. E15 won't happen before every small refinery is shut down because right now we're counting on volunteer blending. Um, what we call the blender loophole. Small refineries do not have the ability to bend. Large integrated refineries have the ability to blend more than they produce. Until this market distortion is fixed, it's a recipe for destroying those refineries that cannot blend. So if we want to keep pushing E15, if we have in fact determined that E15 is results in reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, which is something that I don't, I don't think we at all agree with. Um, we need to fix the structure of a program. I was interested in the discussion of cost caps. So at very many times, um, limitations on the ability to speculate in the RIN market, limitations on the cost of a RIN, obligating blenders, all of these proposals to fix the things that are preventing renewable fuel blending have not occurred. So if we just go straight ahead, um, we're going to just collateral damage our, uh, our industry. Ms. Gore, could, could, first of all, I want you to be able to respond to that, but couldn't a future administration, instead of pushing E15, push, you know, just eliminate, could, it, could they go to zero? Is, would that be possible, or one gallon or something like that in the law? Senator, thank you for the question. So yes, after 2023, there are no congressionally set um, blending requirements. So EPA does have greater uh, flexibility in terms of setting the, the blending obligations. A few important things, they still have some criteria that they need to consider, jobs creation, energy independence, environmental impact, 
Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that we have all suffered from in every sector is the lack of certainty and stability. And so if there is an obligation, it needs to mean something. If there's a deadline, it means, needs to mean something. One of the things we look forward to in the set is EPA's opportunity to set blending requirements for multiple years in advance, similar to what Ms. Wind was talking about in Oregon. And I think that would help address some of the volatility concerns. Thank you. I wish we had more time, maybe in another round, uh, Mr. Chairman. But um, the, the biggest point that I want to make is that 2022 is here now. Uh, you know, for 10 years, people looked at me like, don't worry, that's in the future. What's well, not in the future anymore? So we, we, have, to, we have to come up with something. And yeah, I'd, bet, I'd rather come up with it with everyone in the room, if you know what I'm saying. Well, as long as that includes us. <laughs> as long as you're in the room with me, Thank I'm you. good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs>